Welcome everyone to another episode of Everything You Need to Know About, where we break down a technical concept for you so you can understand it and do better on your career. In this episode, we are going to go over the DHCP protocol. Before we dive in, we need to take a look at how our computer networks actually work. Okay, so how does this work? Well, very similar to the mailing system that has been used for thousands of years, computer networks use something called IP addresses to identify devices within a network. Each computer has a specific IP address and when one computer wants to send something to another computer on the network, it uses something called a data packet. This data packet, much like an envelope, includes the IP address of the destination device. You can clearly see the correspondence here, pun very much intended. IP address versus actual physical address, envelope versus data packet, pretty straightforward. Initially, we used to have to provide an IP address for each device on the network manually. One of us has to manually operate the seal which is not really a big deal. For example, in your house, if you're dealing with three, four devices that you have to provide IP addresses to. But this is not really transferable to larger networks where you might have setups of thousands or even millions of devices. It is simply non-viable to manually set an IP address for each of those devices. We can't do that, okay? So in October 1993, the Internet Engineering Task Force came up with the DHCP protocol or the Dynamic Host Configuration protocol. First, DHCP was introduced as an extension of the Bootstrap protocol. The Bootstrap protocol was an early network protocol that used to provide IP addresses to devices on the network and give them information like the location of the boot server. It allowed devices, typically diskless workstations, to start up by loading their operating system from a network server. However, the Bootstrap protocol had its limitations. I have no limitations. For example, each device needed to be set up manually all the more reason for DHCP. It might sound simple, but DHCP is very important and has many benefits. For example, it saves us a lot of time from having to manually set up devices and prevents a lot of human errors because when a person is entering an IP address, there is a huge chance that they will fat finger it and type in the wrong one. Also, it is very hard to maintain a good list of each IP address and the device that it has been assigned to. I can't keep track of them anymore. So often, you can get IP conflicts by assigning the same IP address to multiple machines without even knowing it. DHCP simply and automatically assigns an IP address to each device on the network from a specific scope. A scope is basically a list of all available IP addresses for the DHCP server to use on the devices on the network. This scope has all the IP addresses that are available for assignment or lease for end devices on a specific subnet. If you want to learn more about subnets, let me know down in the comments and maybe I'll make a video Video about it. Let's say you have some friends over at your house and they want to join the Wi Fi network and use the internet. Kevin, the Wi Fi is out! The DHCP server will then assign each of your friend's devices an IP address for some amount of time so that they can access the network and use the internet. Now, there's a lot of customization that goes into DHCP. For example, you can tell your DHCP servers which IP addresses you want to be used in a specific scope and even reserve some IP addresses that you don't want to be handed out as part of the DHCP process. If you have a printer, a PS5, or one of those unholy smart fridges, 14,000 dollars for a smart fridge. You can tell your network or the DHCP server the IP is statically assigned to those devices so no conflicts can happen. With DHCP, we can automate the process of configuring our devices. You think that kind of automation is easy? When they go online, when the device joins the network, it will go to the DHCP server and it's going to do its discovery and ask the DHCP server, hey, do you have any IPs available that I can use for a while? The DHCP server will then respond with an IP address and say, yes, I have this IP address. Does this look okay to you? And it will offer up an IP address from the scope given to it. Then the computer will say, yes, I really like this address. I request to take it. That's the DHCP request, which is our third step. Finally, the DHCP server will ask actually acknowledge the request made by the computer and give it out the IP address for a specific time called the least time. It does that by sending a DHCP acknowledgement and saying, okay, that's your IP address. You can use it for X amount of time. This period of time, as mentioned before, 
it's called a lease time. Now, this is generally 24 hours for a home office network, which should be more than fine, but for corporate networks, this can vary a lot depending on your needs and specific use case. And if you want to remember the DHCP process request steps, there's a funny way to do that, which is actually Dora the Explorer. See, discover, offer, request, and acknowledge Dora. Now, let's jump into some technical details about DHCP. When your device requests IP information from the DHCP server, it's not just getting the IP address, it's actually getting four pieces of information. That's your IP address, the subnet mask, the IP address of the default gateway, and the IP address of the DNS server. The IP address is simply your computer's new IP address offered by the DHCP server. A subnet mask is a number that divides your IP into two parts, a network part and a host part. The network part tells you which network you're on. Where am I? And the host part tells you which device this IP belongs to. This kind of helps devices identify if they're on the same local network or if they are on different external networks. The default gateway is your router or the device at the very end or edge of your network that is used to communicate with external networks, which is basically a router. Finally, the DNS server is the server that is used to translate domain names into IP addresses so your computer can find and connect to other websites. You can learn more about DNS in this video here. Now that your computer has gotten those four pieces of information, it can actually go online, access the internet, so you can continue watching compilations of the freshest 2025 memes. I'll leave you to your memes. As you can imagine, doing this manually for one device is actually very doable, but doing it for thousands or even just hundreds of devices is basically impossible. However, if you actually need to statically and manually configure a device, make sure you enter all those four pieces of information correctly so your device can access the network efficiently. The IP address address, the subnet mask, the default gateway IP, and the IP of the DNS server. If you are troubleshooting a device that is having connectivity issues, you should check if it was statically configured. And if it was, verify those four pieces of information, since this is often the cause of the issue. So we talked about a successful DORA process, but what happens if this process fails? What happens if we fail? If a DHCP configuration is not able to successfully negotiate through the DORA process, it will default to the alternate configuration that you set. By default, this is set to use an IPPA address or an automatic private IP address. IPPA is a feature in Windows that will automatically assign an IP address to a device if it cannot successfully negotiate an IP address with the DHCP server. It allows devices to communicate on the same local network if a DHCP server is not available. However, you can't really access the internet or other external networks using an IPPA address. No emails, no internet, no trace. If you prefer it though, you can set your computer to fall back to a static IP address instead of an IPPA address if it can't successfully negotiate with the DHCP server. Okay, but what if I have multiple networks or subnets? Do I need a DHCP server for each one of them? Thankfully not. In this situation, we can use something called a DHCP relay. A DHCP relay is a network device or configuration that allows DHCP communication between clients and servers that are not on the same subnet. Normally, DHCP uses broadcast messages which do not cross routers. There's lines you can't cross. But a DHCP relay can forward these messages to a DHCP server located in a different subnet. So to recap it simply, we have three components, client, the DHCP server, and the IP pool. The client wants to use the network and so it requests an IP from the DHCP server. The server will then take an IP address from the available IP addresses in the IP pool and offer it to the client. The client will will then accept this IP address and use it to access the internet or other networks. This offer has four pieces of information, the IP address itself, the subnet mask, the IP address of the default gateway, and the IP address of the DNS server. This whole process is called the discover, offer, request, and acknowledge. When it is successful, your device can use the network normally and efficiently. All right, guys, that gets us to the end of this episode of everything you need to know about. This one was about DHCP. If you want to learn more about any other technical concepts, let me know down in the comments and I'll gladly make an episode for it. Hit the like button, subscribe, and don't forget to turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss next episode of everything you need to know about. And don't forget to visit DionTraining.com for the best cybersecurity and IT training out there. See you in the next one.